when we design the summit, um, really what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to do what all lean thinkers should do. And we want to think back from the customer and to think about the value to the customer. And to that end, what we're doing is we're looking at all the challenges that face all of us. Um, what problems do we need to solve? And um, we look at those challenges and try and look at those challenges through a lean lens. Can lean thinking and practice um, help us to close the gaps that we identify? We take inspiration from what organizations and individuals are doing, and we're trying to put a program together that we, that we hope that you see that you're not alone. Um, but what we do know is that we know that any application of lean is situational. So even if the high level issues um, uh, share similarities, your situation uh, is unique to you. So we can learn from each other about how we tackle the issues that we face, but don't resort to copying without thinking through the ramifications. Of course, I have to try to come up with some catchy title. And last year, Dan Jones talked about democratizing problem solving. And so taking that a step further, I think what we can do is we can democratize lean, but we need to understand what that means. So um, democratization is the action of making something accessible to all. And when, uh, and when done effectively, lean is about harnessing and developing the capabilities of everyone. Um, this contrasts probably with how many organizations approach the, the challenges that they face. To control and improve, for example, the Six Sigma crowd develop belts. So that's experts that would come in and they would help you to, uh, to solve problems. And we know how that usually ends. Um, line management quite often become disaffected. Um, they wait for the improvement of the OPEX team actually to come along and solve their issues, often doing two rather than with the team members. Even if those experts use lean tools and techniques, such, such programs rarely involve everybody. They're fundamentally flawed in that regard. And given that we face so many challenges, um, why wouldn't we want everyone solving problems and thinking lean? And why wouldn't we want to democratize the approach? Okay, so lean thinking is a set of principles. And to develop highly engaged people to continually solve problems to improve the flow of value to customers. Lean contains a set of specific practices, the working methods and innovations that managers use to improve the effectiveness of work systems, aligning purpose, process, and people. And we know that each of these practices can only be learned through doing. Time and again, we can point to the benefits of a lean approach, not just for an organization, but to society, to customers, to team members and partners, up and down a value stream. And as we planned this event, um, what we decided to do was to focus on seven challenges. Lean's got a point of view on each of those and can be used or has been used to close the gaps that the organizations have in each of these seven. And the, the first challenge is that of productivity. We're told that higher output leads to better wages and a more prosperous economy. But UK productivity has grown by just 0.4% annually since the financial crisis, less than half the rate of the um, 25 richest OECD countries, according to the think tank, the Resolution Foundation. UK household income, which used to be ahead of competitors such as France and Germany, now lags behind, and both UK political parties are well aware that raising productivity is one of the keys to reinvigorating um, economic growth that will be needed to improve public services and reduce taxes from multi-decade highs, um, yet it still shows little sign of improving. Um, there was some stuff in the FT a few weeks ago. Questionnaires carried out in 2020 and 2023 show that very few SMEs are even looking at the issue of productivity. 10% um, of those surveyed haven't done anything. Only 32% measure productivity and make regular improvements. 35% have planned something but not done anything. And 38% say that they've taken some steps. Why? You know, everybody in this room probably knows that lean thinkers have got an answer 
to, to the productivity crisis. Focus on value to the customer, identify the value stream, look at the activities in terms of value and waste, organize for flow at the pull of customer demand. We kind of all know, know that, really. And so, so we're going to talk about that over the, over the next two days. Our second challenge is that of supply chain disruption. Uh, in just a few years, we've been faced with a global pandemic, environmental disasters, geopolitical upheaval, whilst also coping with rising labour costs and transport costs. And there are huge business risks, you know, the Jenga game, associated with where we source and locate activities, both products and services that we provide to customers. Globalisation is a feature of our working lives, but with these conditions, the public policy climate has become less favourable to it. And in a number of countries, we have this populist uh, rhetoric, which is protectionist and, and nationalistic. The question we as managers should be asking is, what does this mean for all of us? What activities should we carry out? And again, lean thinkers have got a point of view. We design the work at the step level, the value stream level, and the extended value stream level, the supply chain level. So, quick question for you. How many of your organizations understand your supply network? Develop a value stream design around some lasting principles. We've got the opportunity to produce close to where we consume. And to do, th to do that, we must address this productivity gap. Then we can compress the supply chains. And of course, well thought out work and supply chain design should be green, which leads us to the third challenge. Long supply chains have an environmental impact. Making things in places where they're not used seems wasteful. And as energy prices and transport costs increase, um, surely we'll begin to understand that the move to low cost labor countries really isn't a form of long-term sustainable competitive advantage. The strategic reason often for setting up new capacity is to develop new markets. Um, but that quite often is lost on when we're thinking short-term and, and, and tactical. Of course, whenever we do an activity, we want it to be green um, and in as green a way as possible. Our actions that impact the climate don't have country borders. You know, so we might hit our own targets by moving some nasty activities offshore, but if they're still being done, it's not really given us any positive change. And I think lean thinkers can solve the problem of producing in a greener way. Um, for those visiting Toyota on Thursday, you'll see fantastic examples of Karakuri Kaizen. This one's from the Toyota Museum in Nagoya. Okay, so just so that you know what we're talking about. So it's using gravity, not energy, to move products closer to team members, reducing energy and improving productivity at the same time. So lean production is green production, really. Just the idea of sell one, mate one is more green than making a batch and then trying to flog it off at a discounted price. The closer the batch size gets to replenishing real demand, the better that we utilize available time and the less inventory that's not sold. So if we can teach economists uh, and maybe some, some accountants um, that the economic order quantity model, first written down by production engineer Ford W. Harris in 1913, is flawed, it assumes setup times, setup costs are fixed, um, when actually they can be reduced through Kaizen, and that we can right size technology, um, then we can have a huge impact on, on the environmental footprint. And, um, you know, just look at, the creativity and thought process in Toyota's leaked document to US car dealers, um, which reveals that the automaker told its dealer network that the lithium and other rare materials required to build one EV could be used to build six plugins or 90 conventional hybrid vehicles. So that's really thinking about what problem are we trying to solve. If overall carbon reduction is the aim, then this is quite an elegant step. This 1690 rule means the overall carbon reduction of those 90 hybrids over their lifetimes 37 times as much as a single battery EV. 
It also means that the stumbling blocks of range anxiety, charging infrastructure and vehicle cost can be managed over a, over a wider period of time. And of course, problem solving doesn't just stop there. So we're going to hear from John, who's sat there somewhere, yeah. Um, uh, we'll hear from John about Toyota's efforts to develop hydrogen technology, pursuing multiple solutions is a funda fundamental underlying thinking in the way uh, lean product development differs from traditional product development. And that's really the, uh, the, 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 ne the, next, the next piece. Lean thinkers have got a lot to offer in this area. Remember, the machine that changed the world wasn't just a book about lean production. Lean thinking also applies to the way products are designed and developed, the supply chain is coordinated, and to the customer interface. And in many ways, the lessons from, uh, from lean pro product development can be more easily translated to different environments than the concepts in lean production. In the UK, design thinking is all the, all the rage. I've got a daughter doing industrial design as a master's, and LPPD is not on their agenda. Um, but um, lean products and process development is, is it's not so much um, so, so much taught. And yet, what you're going to hear is you're going to hear from uh, from Josh, uh, who's come over from Taiwan. Um, uh, that it's that LPPD is a far more comprehensive um, set of activities than than just the design thinking alone. So the core thesis, really, developed by our ward, is that the very aim of product development, the, the product development process, is to create profitable operational value streams, and that the key to doing so predictably, efficiently, and effectively, is to create reusable knowledge. Lean thinkers have lambda. Look, ask, model, discuss, and act. It's a combination of go and see, the set-based concurrent engineering, and the PDCA cycle. Creating usable knowledge requires learning. Such learning leads to looking at the management system, the management behaviors, and the mental models needed for learning to thrive and bring value to customers. In addition, we can identify four cornerstones. Um, of lean product development gleaned from the practices of successful companies like Toyota and its partners. These being the entrepreneur system designer, the chief engineer, value stream principles of cadence, flow and pull, set-based approaches, and a team of responsible experts. So, fifth piece. Managers are bombarded by the latest things, and there's no doubt that COVID's accelerated the use of, of digital solutions. And now no large organizational uh, organization strategy is complete without something on digital transformation. Of course, this all started way before COVID. Uh, back in 2009, Apple started using the phrase, there's an app for that, um, to show the multitude of apps available in their app store. And the investors were all excited about fangs and their stellar returns. Uh, an article in Business Matters from 2023 that Pete gave me just before the, the summit claimed that gl global investment in digital transformation is expected to double between 2022 and 2025. And estimates say that 70% of digital transformations fail. So if you do the maths, the wastage bill could be as high as $2 trillion from those activities. Again, Lean's got a point of view on digital. You'll hear... Next up from Mike Moore about um, lean, low code, no code, and AI. You'll also hear from Theodo, co-founder Fabrice Bernard, about the Lean Tech Manifesto, using lean to scale. And we've got a brilliant case from Waitmans, wherever the guys are um, in the in the room. Okay, to, uh, yeah, from Stephen, um, who've been using lean thinking in virtual work that supports frontline teams. Lean thinkers have a point of view and something to share with digital organizations and also with any organization through their use of digital. The simple advice is start by understanding what problem you're trying to solve. Database decision making and database problem solving are a key part of lean thinking. But don't forget the importance of go see to grasp the condition firsthand. Digital something forward looking, if you like. And to see how much has changed, I took inspiration from Dan and Jim's book, Lean, Lean Solutions. Um, I still think this is the best book, wherever Jim, I still think this is the best book that 
Jim ever wrote and Dan ever wrote. And they did this back in 2005. So the premise in the book in the, is in the subtitle, how companies and customers can create value and wealth together. And in the book, what Dan and Jim did was they proposed there were five core problems that we as consumers are trying to solve. Shelter was the first one. Running and maintaining where you live. Healthcare, a plan for every patient for life. Mobility. So talking about mobility in 2005, way, be, way before there was this, this piece on mobility from all the car companies. So how you organise getting around, the, the car, the bike, the bus, the, the plane and the, 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 uh, the, the, the train and, and so on. Uh, personal finance, financial management, including financial planning, pensions, insurance, alongside separate banking and you know, HMRC activity and all, all that kind of carry on that we do. And then the, the last one was a thing called personal logistics, and that was obtaining all the mundane things uh, that we as consumers need to run our lives. So examples include groceries, a new pair of shoes, some screws from B&Q to fix the shelf, all, all of these types of things. And some of these, if you think about this 19 years since this book was written, some of these things have changed massively. You know, you can now get almost anything on the click of a button from Amazon. I can get my weekly shop from Tesco with similar ease, uh, quickly reselecting frequently purchased favorites. Banking apps are getting better too, and with Apple or Google Pay, many of us don't carry cash anymore. Um, however, some things have been more stubborn to change. If somebody can tell me how I can reduce my household maintenance time, that would be very useful. Last week, I needed a chimney sweep to replace a cowl on our chimney. The jackdaws had already realized that the cowl was missing and were busy making nesting preparations and stuff. The proof was all the twigs and the moss and everything in the fireplace uh, down in the grate. And I called a provider, but they couldn't come. Um, but um, a friend recommended somebody. All that time and the hassle of organizing all these things to maintain shelter isn't inconsiderable. And it's never cheaper than the last call out. It's always more expensive. If anyone's had any building work done on the house, they know that builders rarely come in on time to budget without a snagging list. You know, think quality delivery and cost. And that leads us neatly, really, onto the issue of managing inflation and the cost of living crisis. Uh, from my A-level economics, I remember that inflation is the rate of increase in prices over a given period of time. So how much more expensive the relevant set of goods and services has become over a certain period. Long-lasting episodes of high inflation are often the result of lax monetary policy. And if money supply grows too big relative to the size of the economy, the unit value of the uh, currency diminishes. In other words, its purchasing power falls and the prices rise. So this relationship between money supply and the, and the size of the economy is called the quantity theory of money. It's one of the oldest hypotheses in economics. And our cost of living, um, it, um, our cost of living depends upon the prices of the goods and services and the share of each in our household budget. And to measure our cost of living, we track over time the cost of purchasing a basket of goods and services. And in the UK, we call that the consumer price index, the CPI, and that's the cost of the, of the basket and the percentage change is the consumer price inflation. Currently, um, UK CPI rose 3.2% in March versus a target of 2%. And all of us know target versus actual it then gives us a gap. Um, and it's interesting, actually, that in economics, it, economics works a little bit like creating level pull. You know, for those people that know about, about pull and push, there's a demand side and a supply side. And pressures on the supply or the demand side of the economy can be inflationary. So supply shocks that disrupt production, such as the natural disasters that we were just talking about, or the raise in production costs, such as maybe high oil prices, um, they can reduce overall supply and lead to what we call cost push inflation in which impetus for price increases comes from a disruption to supply. Conversely, demand shocks, such as, say, for example, a stock market rally or expansionary policies, such as when a central bank lowers the interest rates or a government raises spending, um, 
uh, can temporarily boost overall growth uh, demand and, and economic growth. If, however, that increase in demand exceeds an, econo an economy's production capacity, the resulting strain on the resources is reflected in demand pull inflation. Policymakers must find this right balance between boosting demand and growth when needed without overstimulating the economy and causing inflation. Most economists now believe that low, stable, and most importantly, predictable inflation is good for an econo economy. In other words, hey, junker. Right? Say, so junker in the economy. That's what is a good thing for us. And in, if inflation is low and predictable, it's easier to capture it in price adjustment, contracts and interest rates, reducing the distortion. And moreover, knowing that the prices will be slightly higher in the future gives consumers an incentive to make the purchases sooner, which actually also boosts the activity. So what does the A-level um, the, 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 the A, the A lesson on, uh, on a bit of economics have to do with lean? Well, we can all play a part. You know, we, we can all play a part, but it really does depend upon the underlying thinking of the sector that we work in. For many sectors, the underlying thinking is cost plus profit equals price. And if we think about the lady doing the work on our house up the chimney, um, her expenses have gone up, her van costs more to fill with diesel, her food bill's gone up, She's now got a 20 mile an hour speed limit in Wales, which means that she can't do as many call outs as she used to be able to do, thanks to Mr. Uh, Mr. Whatever his name is that, that, was, uh, that was in charge of Wales, uh, Wales's uh, uh, speeding limits. And, um, and if she doesn't know about Kaizen, she'll just pass those costs on to the customer and, and therefore higher price. But when one company in the sector uses this equation, Profit equals price minus cost. The dynamics can change. If the market sets the price, then the way to increase profit is to remove waste. It gives a strategic double benefit. We can retain the margin or be even more competitive by sharing some of that benefit in the form of lower prices, being careful not to cause deflation, and or better salaries. So it's a win-win-win for everyone. And this leads us to the final challenge for this year's summit. Are you fretting about the looming skills gap and its potential impact on your organization? The skills gap is a chronic problem. In the late 1960s, companies identified the need for more engineers. In the 2020s, it's computer programmers and coders. The 2020 World Economic Forum report claimed 40% of the core skills in the average job will change in the next five years. We've one le year left to see whether that forecast is true. But there's little denying that all our organisations need their list of the top five skills for 2025. Interestingly, they've got much to do with lean. We've often associated A3 thinking with the development of analytical thinking, problem solving and creativity. We know that sound lean product and process development develops critical thinking, analysis and innovation. And it's easy to say what these skills, um, uh, you know, what, what skills are that we would like. It's also relatively easy once we've identified a standard to define the gap between where we are and where we want to be. But the difficulty is deciding what to do to close the gap. So over the next couple of days, you'll hear from presenters about what they're doing to close their skills gap. Toyota's keynote fits squarely into this. It's called Flexible Motivated Members uh, that John's going to talk about. In terms of problem solving, the Canal and River Trust, they'll, they'll share how they're developing A3 problem solving capability. And Ologic will share how they're doing rapid problem solving and how they're developing that capability. The key point, though, is not the tools being used, but the development of the learning processes to develop capability. And Dave, Peter, uh, they, they're going to share such a process for developing core leadership skills. And we can, I think we can close the, those organizational gaps using a good thinking way, a good process. And we can measure the effectiveness, both in terms of development and retention of how well um, that process is performing so that we can continuously improve it. Okay, so in summary, 
Here are the seven challenges we want to address this year. I personally think lean's more relevant than ever, but I would say that because, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Um, but a word of caution. Problem solving is situational. You might not have all these challenges, and some of them may be more important to you than others. So remember these two important questions. What problem do you need to solve? What gaps do you need to close? And remember, there are purpose, process, and people elements at play in each one of these challenges. We've got to find a balance between them and experiment with ways to democratize, to make lean accessible to everyone. And it follows logically that if we are to stand the chance of democratizing lean, leaders need to do that for themselves, they need to use processes that help them become self-reliant in the approach. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.